Vice President, members of the media, good afternoon. First of all, I want to take this opportunity to express once again on my own behalf and on that of the government our condolences to the family, friends and the community from which Isaiah and Joel came from. I've had the opportunity this morning to speak to the father of Isaiah and the mother of Joel. Indeed, the, this is a horrific incident and I've spoken to the Commissioner of Police and the Minister of Home Affairs in ensuring that all the tools available, all the resources available are utilized to ensure that the perpetrators of this crime are brought to justice swiftly. I took the opportunity to express to the family on behalf of the people of Guyana too our condolences. Members of the media and those who are listening via live broadcast this morning, this afternoon, sorry, I want to take the opportunity to share with you a number of measures and policies that your government will be pursuing in the immediate term to bring relief, to stimulate economic activity, put back people to work, to increase our productive capacity, to reduce the costs of doing business, to improve efficiency, and facilitate the growth and development of businesses. These measures, no doubt, will have an immense impact on people's welfare and well-being. A number of the, of the measures would address directly issues of cost of living and living standards. During the campaign, we were committed ourselves to a number of initiatives which, I assure you, the government is going to pursue and ensure we realize. Notwithstanding those commitments, however, we have been able over the last three to four weeks to do a rapid assessment of the situation in our economy and in our country. I would ask our Vice President to address you specifically on some of those challenges so that you and the media and the Guyanese population can understand the context in which the emergency budget is crafted and you can understand the context under which these measures are crafted. Indeed, to realize a number of these measures, it required reprioritizing of resources and reprogramming of resources to ensure that the priority of government and the priority of the emergency budget is to address people's issue, to address issues that affect communities, businesses, the economy. So more resources were directed towards these efforts. And it is in this context that I want to share with you some of the measures 
that will be implemented. First of all, in terms of the value added tax, we will immediately see a reversal of VAT on electricity and water. This of course would bring tremendous benefit to all aspects of our economy. It will reduce the cost of operations for manufacturing. It will help the poultry industry. It will help every household and every aspect of economic life. Indeed, it would also put back more money in people's pocket. Secondly, is a removal of VAT and duties on machinery and equipment to allow for the recapitalization of key sectors, including mining, forestry, agriculture, and manufacturing. So we have the removal of VAT and duties on machinery and equipment. In addition to this, because of representation from the sector, we have decided also on the granting of, con of tax concessions on for mining, forestry, agriculture, and manufacturing. So this is another major initiative and commitment in terms of our manifesto that would bring immediate relief to the mining, forestry, agriculture, and manufacturing sector, all of which have been underperforming, and all of which would have been faced with tremendous difficulties. The estimate is that 65% of the productive capacity in the mining sector has been lost. So this will help to recapitalize the sector. This would bring back all the medium and small miners into productive capacity and operation. It will help to create jobs, create wealth, and of course the trickle-down effect on the rest of the economy. It will bring back the forestry operators. Forestry has had tremendous difficulties over the years. And this would help the forestry operators manufacturing and agriculture, as I said. Fourthly is the reversal of land leases, land lease fees. That is all the increases that we would have had over the last five years on land lease fees. We are reversing all of that back to the position it was in 2014. So for example, in consultation with the poultry sector, they would have said that between 2015 to now, the land lease fees would have increased by 1,350%. So we are reversing that back to the 2014 position. Again, this would help all the productive sector. This would help agriculture, farmers. This would help almost all the segments in our population that are connected to food production, the productive sector, etc. Fifthly is the removal of VAT on fertilizers, agrochemicals, pesticides, and key inputs in the poultry sector. So it's a removal of VAT on fertilizers, agrochemical, and pesticide for the entire sector, and of course, key inputs in the poultry industry. The reverse, the, sixthly, the reversal of VAT on exports, on all exports. This would, of course, help our manufacturing sector. This would help our exporters to become more competitive. This would help them in terms of the cost of production and will make them, of course, more profitable. We expect that these measures would stimulate expansion in the various sector, thus creating jobs and opening up new opportunities. Very importantly is the remo removal of VAT 
on hinterland travel. As you're aware, members of the hinterland community, the business community, the uh, air operators, the tourism sector has been raising this continuously. The increase in goods and services and movement of people has brought tremendous burden on hinterland communities. Thus today, we are removing that burden by the removal of VAT on hinterland travel. Next is the removal of VAT on all medical supplies. Now that the COVID-19 pandemic is here, we know the strain it is causing on the population in terms of not only addressing issues of COVID-19, but all medical supplies, those who have diabetes and so on. And this, of course, will create an even playing field. This will put back money directly into the pockets of pensioners, families, children, medical institutions. And this really would reduce the cost of health care. So the removal of VAT on all medical supplies will bring tremendous benefit to the entire population. Next, we have the removal of VAT on building and construction materials. And these are buildings and building and construction material where VAT was imposed after 2014. We are now removing the VAT that was imposed on all those building and construction material. Indeed, a major plank of our development path is the construction sector, building homes, ensuring people have great opportunity of owning homes, spending less in owning those, those homes. And a major component of our future development is infrastructure transformation, transformation of buildings and so on. So to stimulate the construction sector, which has the tremendous potential of creating many new jobs and opportunity, we are now going to remove VAT on building and construction material. Very importantly, as we promised in the manifesto too, is the removal of VAT on cell phones. So on the purchase of cell phones, which is becoming an integral tool, even for children, for communities, for learning purposes, we are now going to remove VAT on cell phones. In keeping with our campaign promises, and also in keeping with what is required in advancing our country, we spoke about health care and education becoming export earners for us, so we have to start building the capacity, putting the mechanism in place to encourage investment in health care and education. So we have decided to remove corporate tax on private education. Remove corporate tax on private education. We are hoping too that the private institutions now can address issues of costs of education to, to children because they will benefit now from the removal of corporate tax on private education. Then, in order to make health care uh, more affordable and to support the expansion of the healthcare sector to become a foreign uh, uh, an export owner potential, we're removing corporate tax on private healthcare. So we have the removal of corporate tax on private education and the removal of corporate tax on private healthcare. Again, to stimulate the economy, to ensure more people have access to loans, to ensure that more young people, young professionals, can benefit from incentives of owning their own homes. We have decided in terms of mortgage interest relief to increase the sum that you will have the income tax relief or the tax relief to $30 million. So the mortgage interest relief Interest incurred on housing loan up to 30 million will be now tax deductible from your income tax. So this will help new homeowners, this will help young people where 
your loans for housing up to $30 million, the interest from those loans will become income tax deductible. Of course, this will bring tremendous, tremen tremendous ease and uh, reduction in terms of the cost of home ownership and will put back more money in people's pocket. Next is the increase of the limit for low income loan for, to qualify for corporate tax relief in the banking sector to $10 million. So right now, the limit is $8 million for the banks to qualify for corporate tax relief. That will now be taken up to $10 million. So the special interest rate for low income loans that apply to loans up to $8 million would now apply to loans up to $10 million. As you know, over the last five years, we have had tremendous increases in license fees, some by almost 500%. So the next measure will address this directly. Any license that was increased and renewed after the 1st of October 2020 would be reduced by 50%. So all those license fees that were increased by three, four hundred percent, two hundred percent, you will see that a reduction to, uh, back to it by half, reducing those increases by 50%. In order to stimulate the logging industry in the forestry sector and to help sawmillers, we're going to change the log export policy to allow sawmillers to now export logs. This would increase production and taxes, whilst it would give tremendous help to small loggers and the sawmillers. In keeping with the campaign promise and in discussion with various stakeholders, we're going to reverse the policy to allow for importation of used tires. You would recall that there was a policy that barred used tires to be imported. We're going to reverse that policy. Similarly, we're going to reverse the policy to allow for importation vehicles more than eight years old. So that vehicle ownership for the poor, for the vulnerable, for those who use cars for taxi services will become cheaper, easier, more accessible, and more, more affordable. We are developing countries and our policies and programs must be in keeping with our development path. Similarly, we, have, we are going to reverse, revert to the policy where half-cut vehicles over eight years would now be allowed to be imported. Half-cut vehicles over eight years would now be allowed to be imported. Importantly, Effective from the 1st of January 2020, we would introduce the 15,000 cash grant for school children. Effective from the 1st of January 2020, we'll be introducing the 15,000 cash grant for school children. This, of course, will bring tremendous help to families, to parents, and to children by which time they will hopefully be returning to school under the improved situation that we have now as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Secondly, we will double the uniform, school, the, the uniform voucher allowance to 4,000 per child. We will double the school uniform voucher allowance to 4,000 per child. To 4,000 per child. Effective 1st of January 2020, the pension for old age pensioners will be $25,000 per month. Effective 1st of January 2020, old age pensioners can look forward for a pension of $25,000 per month. In order to help hinterland communities to 
promote development in hinterland communities and return those jobs that were lost. That is a reintroduction of the CSO program. We have set aside $800 million for the Amerindian Development Fund. In order to rejuvenate Gaisuku, rehabilitate, and to bring back those estates into operation, recreating those jobs and supporting the economies in those areas where the estates were closed. We are setting aside $5 billion for budgetary support for Gaisuku directly. In order to reduce the cost of living, put more money back into our pensioners' pocket, and ensure that their welfare and well-being are taken care of, we are going to revert the free water for pensioners. Free water for pensioners. In order to continue to support our men and women in uniform, to ensure that we do all that is possible within the constraints of the economy, we are announcing a two weeks tax-free bonus for the joint services. Two weeks tax-free bonus for the joint services. We understand and appreciate the tremendous work that our health workers, our frontline workers are doing, the sacrifices they are making in ensuring we remain safe and we are protected. As a result, given the work that they have done for COVID-19 and continue to do, we are setting aside $150 million for frontline workers. $150 million for frontline workers. As a result of the COVID-19, and in keeping with our old plan and program to expand e-learning and distance learning to help during this COVID period, we are setting aside $200 million to expand Guyana Learning Channel. In keeping, in keeping with our commitment in ensuring that household in every, every household in our country benefit from access to electricity and energy, we are going to implement a program immediately within this emergency budget that will bring 25,000 solar units to the hinterland. 25,000 solar units to the hinterland. Again, to help the mining sector to make it easier in doing business we are removing the requirement to register and take out road license for mining equipment. Removing the requirement to register and take out road license for mining equipment. We are also removing the requirement for police clearance for miners to transport fuel in their own vehicles. These in discussion with the miners were impediment to their work and created tremendous bureaucracy. And we have addressed both. In order to continue to help the poultry sector, we're going to revert the poultry industry to zero rated VAT status. Revert the poultry industry to zero rated VAT status. This indeed is going to increase investment in the industry increase production, and ultimately bring down costs to the benefit of the consumers. We're also going to grant special incentives, inclusive of land to be made available for the planting of corn and soybean to satisfy local and regional feed mill demands. Over the years, we have seen tremendous investment in feed mills in Guyana. And we have the capacity now not only to fulfill 
the local uh, requirement, but also regional requirement. However, in getting additional benefit in the value-added chain and the input chain, we are now going to give special incentives for those feed mill operators to invest in local corn and soybean production. This, of course, will create an opportunity also for those farmers in the agricultural sector. Right now, they're importing the corn and soybean in the food production, in the feed production, sorry. We're also going to grant tax concessions on investment in agro-processing facilities, cold storage, and packaging. We're going to support drainage and irrigation services, also reversing those increased charges for drainage and irrigation services in our agricultural area. We're going to invest in farm-to-market access roads to make it more affordable and efficient in the transportation of goods from farm to market, but more importantly, a new farm-to-market access road to open up new lands for production and to aid the agricultural sector. Land and water charges are going to re reverse to the rate at the end of 2014. In order to support our security sector, to support the police force in understanding the new environment in which they operate, with great economic activity in hinterland communities, they are required to move more swiftly with a different type of vehicle. So we are going to acquire 50 new 4x4 vehicles for the Guyana Police Force. In order to improve communication, access, and link to communities, we are setting aside $1.5 billion for hinterland, urban, and rural roads. In order to ensure that food production in Region 1 increases, in order to support the farmers, support the community, support trade, support uh, building of services, reduce the time of connection between Georgetown and the rest of Guyana and Region 1, you will see, we'll commence in this budget, the work to have a new ferry for Northwest. And this ferry would be able also to provide coal storage capacity for farmers from Region 1. In order to continue to support primary health care, to improve our capacity, to improve the infrastructure on the ground, and to deliver better health care services, we're going to upgrade the hospitals at Saudi, New Amsterdam, Lenora, West Demerara, and Diamond. We understand the tremendous impact the COVID-19 pandemic would have had on life in every single community. We understand how, it's, how, it's, how it has affected some community in surviving. And while some community may not feel the impact as much as others, traveling across Guyana over the last six, seven months, I can tell you, the pain is real. I can tell you. The damage is real. The heart is real. And whilst we cannot do all we want to do, in this budget, we are setting aside $25,000 per household for COVID-19 relief. $25,000 per household for COVID-19 relief. We are hoping that this can help in some way to support families, many of whom do not have enough food to put on the table at this moment. So this 25000 per household, I know, will go a far way in supporting those who are vulnerable and in critical need. That is why we are pursuing this direct cash transfer 
to every household. Very soon, we will be announcing a special incentive investment regime with key incentives for some key areas. There are some areas in Guyana that will identify a specific investment zone, areas that some may consider depressed now, but in which if we put together the right mix of invest, investors and investment with incentive mechanism will become areas, the new areas of growth and development. You will see special incentives for new hotels. We are pursuing an agenda where we can at least have four new hotels in our country with the expansion that will take place. The demand will be there. We are committed to the liberalization of the telecommunications sector. And shortly we'll be dealing with this in a comprehensive way. But I want to assure all stakeholders that the liberalization of the telecommunications sector is uppermost on the agenda. Finally, to continue to support the growth and development of our young people, our sports men and women in finding new talent and supporting every region of our country, we're going to build three multi-purpose sports complex in region two, six, and 10. These are some of the investment measures and policies that we'll pursue in this emergency budget and in January to bring relief, to create opportunities, and to improve the welfare and well-being of all the people of our country. Whilst we pursue these measures, the Vice President and his team has been working already on crafting the framework for the more elaborate budget and more elaborate program for 2021. But we cannot sit by and wait on 2021. The challenges communities are facing, the challenges people are facing, are real challenges that are there now. That is why we have so aggressively moved on these measures to address those challenges and problems now. I assure Guyana that your government has your best interests at heart and that we will continue to work with all of you in making life better and bringing happier times ahead for you. Thank you. I'll now ask our Vice President, who has responsibility for the area of finance, to elaborate and to address you on some of the policies and programs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President. We have listened to the President extensively laying out some of the policy measures that he has given approval to for inclusion in the budget that will be presented on Wednesday. He spoke extensively about the justification for some of the policy measures and I'm sure that by now you can see a clear pattern emerging. But I want to thank the President for allowing in this such a short period of time the fulfillment of so many of the promises that the People's Progressive Party made on the campaign trail and that he himself spoke about on the platform. As you can see, quite a few. In fact, although an emergency budget, we have substantively addressed most of the tax measures 
that we promised to, to deal with in the new government. And if you travel across this country, until now you can see many of the scrolls that are hanging on the post, the lantern post. And you will see if you, many of the measures that the president announced earlier, that they are an early fulfillment of those promises that were made and to the people of this country. We do not take our promises lightly. And therefore, I'm so pleased that we've been able to, in such a, within a month of the new government, move to address a lot of these issues. The underlying philosophy of the budget will not depart radically from that of the manifesto. And what was that philosophy? That we wanted to return Guyana to a coherent economic policy. We believe the last government did not have a coherent economic policy. It was a policy based on consumption, collection of large amounts of taxes, and consumption on the recurrent side of the budget. Largely going to, if you look at the, the growth in specific items in the budget, you will see that employment costs skyrocketed and other charges skyrocketed. And these were not creating value for people. So we, you heard us on the campaign trail speak about the large sums of money, billions of dollars of increase on vehicle rentals and on rentals of premises for individuals and offices. That's where a significant part of the budgetary increases went to. And on employment costs, it did not necessarily go to higher wages and salaries, but an uh, explosion of unnecessary exp employment. President was pointing out to me that in one agency alone, that they had 700 more staff than 2014. And a lot of the staff there not necessarily doing productive work. So our you cannot manage a country by only taxing and consuming. You had to have a policy, and that's when we crafted our manifesto, that returned incentives to the productive sector. And you heard the president sp speak extensively about several measures that will give incentives to the private sector to produce more in every sector of our economy, from machinery and equipment to help on the VAT, well, the removal of VAT on electricity and water, which will cut their costs, etc. Secondly, the budget, so, so this budget has substantially returned an incentive framework to the productive sectors through the reduction of land rental charges, licensing fees, um, as I said before, water and electricity, inputs, removal of VAT on inputs. Um, these, are, these are going to assist our productive sectors to create more wealth and to generate more employment for people. And that was one of the primary tasks that we set ourselves in the manifesto, which was the creation of more jobs. In fact, we said 50,000 jobs, and we have to, have to get that, that done. So the second philosophy or area of focus in our manifesto, and the president spoke about this, is allowing people to keep more money in their pockets that they earn. And so when you see the pensioners having now not, they don't have to pay for water or electricity or pay, pay um, I mean, VAT on electricity or on water, 
then people are keeping more money in their pockets. The third area of focus was cost of living. So with the removal of VAT on so many um, items, including medical supplies, etc., this will impact enormously on cost of living. And then, of course, getting more money into people's pockets, which is, are the direct transfers that the president spoke about. So altogether, if you look at the measures in the new budget, and a combination of direct incentives um, and a reduction of taxes, the Guyanese public will benefit from over $20 billion of ta relief. That is through direct transfers to them or through a reduction of taxes. They'll be allowed to keep 20, over $20 billion. And that is in this period, the, the period between now to December. If you annualize the measures that the president spoke about. So although we have three months now, and you have to calculate the tax incentives only for three months, but if you annualize it for the whole year next year, the, the, the increase that he announced for the pensioners alone, moving from to about $20,000 to $25,000, will put some $4.5 billion more in the pockets of pensioners. And the increasing returning the school kids grant and increasing it to 15,000, another 2.5 billion. Those two measures alone next year will uh, put in the pockets of families seven billion dollars, seven billion dollars more of assistance. If you look at the cost of machinery and equipment, that will put another $2 billion back into the pocket of the manufacturing sector, not the manufacturing sector. And the VAT on electricity and water, over $2 billion annualized. I can itemize the, the, the issues, the measures announced by the president, but I shall not do so now because you'll hear more about it in the budget. Just to see that once annualized, the measures announced by the president would result in in excess of $40 billion next year in relief to the Guyanese public and through direct incentives to them, over, over $40 billion. So without belaboring the point, I, the president spoke about the context of the budget and he asked me to in a brief way outline the context of the budget so most of you know that the economy was having a hard time because of the lack of incentives even before COVID. And then after COVID, the economy went into a tailspin. Just to give you a brief idea about what to expect from the sectors of the economy for the rest of the year, based on mid-year figures and a projection for the rest of the year. Agriculture, forestry, and fishery is expected to decline by over 2%. Bauxite between 40 and 50%. Gold mining by 0.2%. Manufacturing around decline. Construction will con decline. Services have contracted and will contract even further. Wholesale and retail, for example, by 14%. Accommodation and food, 32%. Entertainment and recreation, 46%. Other services, 51%. 
These are the main areas of our economy, the main sectors of our economy, and they are all in decline, all in decline. The, apart from this, you have a significant number of public enterprises and subvention agencies that are also um, in decline or posting a deficit. Kaisuko, GPL, GWI, GFC, MMA, Lands and Survey, just to name a few. So the context of, in creating the budget is one where all the real sectors or the entire economy and many state enterprises are in decline, except in the oil, oil and gas sector. Secondly, the revenue, central government revenue, has been reduced by $14 billion. That is about a 5.9% reduction from 2019. So it's not just the real sector in decline and public enterprises, but it's also the revenue of the state that is in decline. So without painting an even grimmer picture, the total budget is about $330 billion. This represents uh, an increase of about $28.8 billion, $29 billion over 2019, which is a 9.6% over 2019. Now, you would think that, well, we are in September now. Why this big budget? Well, a substantial part of this money has been spent already by APNO. So, of the $330 billion, $72 billion is for capital expenditure. And if you take out the foreign-funded capital expenditure, it leaves $49 billion of local expenditure. That is in the budget. But of this $49 billion, 27 has already been spent based on rollover from 2019 when they went on, APNU went on a spending spree with money it didn't have that was not approved in the budget when it gave out illegally at large numbers of contracts in 2019. So that and that rollover plus releases of money on the capital side, which is downright illegal because there was no budget for 2020, yet the government released money. And just a tiny part of it was for COVID, the bulk of it was for other things. So when you combine the two, unauthorized basically spending, that's $27 billion of the $49 billion in this year's budget has already been spent as of July 31st. That is before the PPP got into office. So really, we only had room in this budget from local expenditure to program $22 billion for new initiatives. That is, and a similar picture is painted on the recurrent side. So I, I don't want to go through all the recurrent expenditure, the non-interest current expenditure, but, I, but that increased too. Um, but a lot of it is from the annualization of wages and salaries from 20, 2019, and the 2019 wages and salaries had to be added in the first part of year. That was already paid out. Goods and services, you had huge amount of spending, 
and um, transfer payment and subsidies will account for, for some of the increase in non-interest current expenditure. So just to give you an idea that although the budget is larger this year, it, a substantial part of the money has been spent and that, that basically stymied the initiatives that we wanted to pursue. Notwithstanding that, we found room to fulfill most of our tax promises in our manifesto, which as you know, will be a big boost and at some point in time we can go through them because each measure, as the president outlined, uh, each measure has an enormous impact on the, on the sectors. For example, just spending $200 million more, as the president said, on taking the learning channel digital would have five channels now that we can broadcast continuously, five learning channels now broadcasting continuously into homes because people don't ha have to have Wi-Fi now to connect, they can turn on their TVs and we're working out an initiative where in the hinterland in each village we can put in TVs so they can then tune into the broadcast, the learning channel and there'll be five channels so that we can, we can revolutionize the delivery of education even in this short period. Um, the seven billion dollars in this budget has been set aside for COVID assistance. Seven billion here, um, uh, as the president pointed out, five billion to Gaisuko and that will be a combination of help to people as well as the as restarting the, um, the plans to restart the sugar estates, a campaign promise that we made and we intend to, to fulfill. There, there, there are a number of other issues that we, um, we would announce later because although the president spoke so much about these measures, there's still measures that would be elaborated on further in the budget. Let me just say that apart from these immediate measures in an emergency budget, which is, I believe, I've been associated with budgets for a long time. I believe in the shortest period, these are the most significant measures and the largest number of measures ever in any budget that I've seen in, uh, well, not for just emergency budgets, but even budgets of, that have the duration for the entire fiscal period, calen the calendar year. So, so it is a substantive budget in itself. And I must say that I'm really happy that the president immediately took hold of the situation. Every single day I see him working at laying out the broader vision. And so whilst you're not going to see the bigger framework now, which I hope that he will address the parliament soon and then lay out his vision for the five years, but he mentioned some elements on them. Like personally, you saw a slew of measures to get the housing sector going here, to make financing cheaper. But he is also directed that we start with, that we raise a bond to finance housing construction for low-income housing. He is personally, I've seen it, looked at land where we have land across the country. He's got the map and he's now matching the availability of ma the land with the demand. Driving that at his level because that was a major promise in the manifesto. He's given clear directions. He wants the balance between protect that moving forward, ensuring that our environment is protected, that we have the strongest local content policy on for to ensure that Guyanese 
benefit and they must benefit from the oil and gas sector but he wants to move it along to get production up to um, so he's been giving leadership in this area you so you've seen the um, him setting up a committee that would advise on local content policy the license is being worked on working through the issues and he's already been gearing up to start the discussions on on the gas to energy project so those issues uh, we, the bridge he's already given directions that he wants within a matter of weeks the the um, the add out for the the bridge across the Demerara River and he's outlined what type of bridge he wants um, the hotels ad would be out soon so whilst these are tax measures that will bring benefits to people I want you to understand that there is an overarching vision here and a philosophy an economic philosophy that will focus on productive infrastructure on the ease of doing business on getting the non-oil economy to produce and also a significant amount of spending on on welfare of our people I will not today address anything further just to say that I'm not going to go into the monetary issues um, or the balance of payment issues here nor will I elaborate further on the fiscal accounts these um, you will hear about in the in the budget um, and I will not be presenting the budget um, the budget would be read by by Minister of Public Works we have substantially com um, substantively completed the estimates and all that is and they've gone to the printers and so now the speech is being worked on and the Minister of Public Works would read that um, we thought it's important enough that the president himself since his office is basically maintain oversight over finance that he himself lead in this regard because as you know he um, has been cri critical in crafting the manifesto and he was our economic spokesperson in Parliament when we were in opposition so um, that, that's all I'm going to present that now this time thank you thank you very much uh, members of the media we ask time for some uh, a few questions Yes, thank you. Uh, Kimok, King, Kaitor News. Apart from the prosecution of the killings that have happened over the past few days, one of the biggest issues that this uh, problem has reignited is the deep-seated racial conflict that the country is facing. Do you have a plan to confront and to resolve this problem, and, and could you speak about it a little? Secondly, uh, could you give an update on the negotiations um, concerning the review of the PIR project? And I'm going to give a little um, context to um, the environmental issues that are being faced. We have produced water being dumped at the LISA Phase 1 operation, and flaring of billions of cubic feet of natural gas. Uh, have you instructed ExxonMobil to commission the infrastructure necessary to bring these issues to a halt? And are you prepared to allow the Payar project to go forward while ExxonMobil continues to pollute the environment? Finally, the country is in a very sad um, financial position, and we have a natural resource fund in a New York Federal Reserve Bank. Given the issues that you're facing and all the um, provisions that, that you just talked about. Do you intend to tap into the Natural Resource Fund as it is to 
uh, finance the budget. Thank you very much, Kimar. To begin with, uh, the issue of race relations and race conflict, as you describe it, it's a very important issue for us nationally. It's not only an issue for the government, it's an issue for us collectively as a people. That's the first thing. The government, though, has a responsibility of charting policies and programs that reflect the needs and aspirations of all the people of our country. And that is the first thing. In terms of public policy and programming, we have to ensure that our public policy and programs are designed for all the people of our country. And that is a great responsibility of the government, and that is what you will see reflected in the way we craft our policy. But the media, especially mainstream media, has an important role to play too. How we capture a headline can be the difference in how people react. I have had over a thousand, and this is no exaggeration, I have had over a thousand Facebook posts sent to me in the last 24 hours. Some from people who I would have great respect for, for their intellect, their level of education. But their posting is not only damaging and insen insensitive, but their posting borders on criminality itself. And as your president, I want to say we have to address these issues frontedly. We have to not only monitor, but we have to take strong actions <clears throat> on social media for some of the hateful posts and speeches that are being pursued on social media. Some of the assumptions that is damaging and have serious implications. Addressing issues of race relation requires a level of maturity from every stakeholder. It requires a level of responsibility from every stakeholder. So yes, as a government, we'll address the issue through our policies and programs. We intend to put into place the Youth uh, Advisory Council and a major component of the terms of reference of the Youth Advisory Council is to work on race relations, to create a new culture, a new, envir a new environment, a new sense of purpose, to go out there in at-risk communities and to develop a framework of action that the government can pursue to help at-risk communities. But I say to you, this requires all of us to play a part. And we are committed to it. We are committed to it. And committed to doing our part. <clears throat> in terms of the financial, the resources in the Natural Resources Fund, it's a very important question. Because, of course, the country has needs. The country is going through its own crisis with the COVID pandemic. We have a transformational set of investment that has to be made now to create opportunities for the future. That would require us reaching into as much resources as we can. But importantly is also the issue of transparency and accountability, ensuring that the systems and institutions are in place before we utilize any resources so that our country, our people can understand that it's done in an open and transparent way. There is no secrecy behind the use of any resources. So those are the things that we are putting in place now. We are building up the mechanism, building up the institutions, building up the framework, building up the guidelines, the rules. We have to get the commission in place. We have just put in place the advisory body on local content. We have to have an advisory body in the terms of the review of various areas 
the, the review that we spoke of, those are, these are all things that has to be put in place and setting up the institutions. In terms of the negotiation and, and the PR project, let me say to you that I have asked the, the Vice President and the Minister of, uh, of, of Natural Resources, Vikram Bar, to look at this <coughs> excuse me, on a daily basis and to advise me. Um, we have to strike the balance. We have to ensure that in the review we get more for local content. <coughs> Important for our development is bringing the natural gas to shore and the flaring that is taking place, to end that, we have to bring the natural gas ashore. You can't stop production, but we have to ensure that we have commitment in getting the natural gas on shore that to benefit the people of this country, to benefit the local, the, uh, local content, and to create new opportunities. This is critical. How do we create the path to ensure we get this in the fastest possible way, that we get the commitment now to get these things done? So those are things that the Minister of Natural Resources and the Vice President, or, or the Vice President, they're looking at it on a daily basis. I'll ask him to add in relation to this, but I want to assure you uh, on, the, on the other issues you would have raised, the comments I made. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the last thing I wish to do is to, <clears throat> to telegraph our position in the negotiations. Yeah. There is an ongoing negotiation between Exxon and the government of Ghana over issues that we do not see eye to eye on in the Payara license. We have differences. and. Uh, I do not want to telegraph what may be our, our final position. But let me just say generically that we don't favor flaring. We're opposed to flaring. And secondly, that we believe that any water discharge, whether reinjected or discharged, must be treated to international standards. That is, that is in the two matters that you asked me about, but these are generic positions. Um, we see this as a continuum. Exxon is not going to disappear tomorrow. Payara license is not the only opportunity that we have to get what the president said we wanted and what the People's Progressive Party campaigned on, which is an industry that benefits the investor but significantly benefits Ghanaians, our people, through jobs, business opportunities, etc. So I would, there are numerous opportunities in this continuum. This is not a one event activity where Payara will determine our, all of our relationship or determine all of our negotiating positions or opportunities because there will be one when we come to talk about local content and local content legislation. There'd be another negotiating opportunity when we talk about gas and the development of our gas fields and the price for gas and how much of it comes on shore and how it will benefit our people. A ton of, we have to talk also about training opportunities. We made that clear that, that Exxon has to do more for training of Ghanaians. We have, we have to aggressively pursue costs of the company because so far they, they have not audited a cent or completed the audit of a cent of, of the cost, even pre-production um, costs. The exploration costs up to 2017 and, and costs up to 2017 and now being audited. So there are large opportunities for us to agree or disagree with costs. We see some areas where we don't believe that 
expenditures that are made now or are part of cost oil should be part of cost oil. So I don't see this and the government does not see this as priorities the make or break. It's, it's important that we get investments too. You know the, the international climate. I saw even in the newspapers them saying about even Exxon's global position, how it has diminished. So investment yes. dollars are, are scarce out there, but that we're not cowed or threatened by that. So the negotiations will proceed. On these matters, we'll move to protect the interests of the country, and they're not the on, on, only issue. So we, on the Natural Resources Fund, the President pointed out, none of it will be used for the emergency budget, but um, we have, as we promised again in the manifesto, to, to address that Natural Resource Fund, to either repeal it or amend it, to make some changes there, and thereafter, uh, along, not thereafter, but along with doing that, we will strengthen the transparency provisions, as the President pointed out. Not only the budgetary provisions for use of the resources, but also a promise that we made of criminalizing non-disclosure. We will pursue that as soon as the budget is out, uh, take a bill to the parliament to, to get that done. And so that's next here. And Mr. President, may I just say one, one thing on the race relations. For, uh, for almost a month now I've seen, without responding, because I was working on, on the budget, a lot of unhealthy, extreme statements being made by many individuals. Some of the most corrupt individuals, discredited individuals, are, seem bent, and the ones who have done the least for race res relations, in fact, who may have be, had a deliberate campaign to exacerbate race relations, they continue, they've continued with this now out of government. And these, some of them have the least credibility. They wouldn't bat an eyelid to take away $600 million from the pensioners. Pensioners of every race, every, 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 every color. They, they wouldn't bat an eyelid. The Granger government didn't do that, but took it away from all the pensioners. They took away $1.6 billion from our school children, children of every race. But they didn't bat an eyelid. They're so concerned about the welfare of, of our, our children. They, they didn't, instead of doing what they should have done on the pension, what they promised to do, which was double pension in 2015, none of it. Now our pensioners are going to have from next year, $4.5 billion more in their pockets. Pensioners of every race. The school kids going to see their uniform and mass allowance double. That's another three, 300 million in school vouchers for children all across the country, from region 10 to region 1. All the kids of every race. Clearly, it is the policies that matter. It's the policies that matter. When they took away the, the vehicle or stopped importing vehicle under eight, eight year, over eight years old, do you think it affected persons of one race? It affected all Guyanese. They didn't care anything. They only care now to stir up trouble. And so, yes, we do have issues, and I, I, I agree with that. But we have to keep working at it and keeping the focus on what is important. Can we get them more jobs, all of our people, employed, having a house, uh, you know, a house lot, and take in their children in school? Safety, the horrific thing that happened to these two kids should have never happened. And as the president said, we hope that the perpetrators 
get caught and punished severely for what they did. That is what it's about. And, and this country came through provocation. It came through probably more than most countries it was tested. And I've seen countries more homogeneous than ours get, get into serious trouble, turmoil in the streets, etc. And although we are ethnically diverse, we came through one of the most troubling periods anywhere in the world in the last five months. And we survived it, and our people stood tall. Our people stood tall, people of every race. So it's not the outliers that matter, it's a core, the large number of people. Some of those same guys who run around there would have preferred to buy a Land Cruiser for $22 million rather than help people on the ground. The same ones who are running out now and saying they're concerned about people. That is what matters. Our country was tested severely and we stood, people of every race stood tall for our country. And so, this is all I have to say, but having said all of that, I have to acknowledge that yes, we have to keep working at this all the time. And severely, as I, the president said, severely punish those who try to divide our people. Any personal staff with you? Good day, President. I, I have questions uh, on three areas. One, you mentioned you're in the middle of negotiations with Exxon Mobil. You don't want to do anything to jeopardize these negotiations. Who is it that decided to send Mr. Adams on leave, or Dr. Adams on leave during these negotiations? And do you believe that that decision helped or harmed your negotiation position? Two, We've noticed in the last month a sharp increase in the number of deaths related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Do you believe that your government is adequately managing this pandemic? What particular measures or specific measures are you going to be putting in place to address this increase or to mitigate the, the spread of this disease? Uh, thirdly, in relation to the Henry children who died over this weekend. The children were murdered allegedly, on, allegedly by farmers. We've seen in 2016, I believe, children again within Canal Number 1 who were tortured for going to pick bird seed, again allegedly by farmers. You said to us today that if we are to address this issue, and in both cases, the children were of one ethnicity and the farmers were of another, allegedly. You said to us that in addressing these issues, you're going to be looking to policy. What specific policy are you going to be put in, in place to, excuse me a second, this is just, what specific policy will you be putting in place to make sure that farmers do not feel, or I'm, again, I'm going to maintain that allegedly farmers, that they do not feel that they have the right to torture children that they find on their land, even if they are supposedly, allegedly tra um, trespassing. Additionally, you've mentioned that you're going to make any resources available that the police might need. Could you give us specifics here as to what you mean when you say resources to address this, um, this particular issue? Thank you very much. Mike is on? Yeah. First of all, let me say to you that as president, I have a responsibility to develop policies and programs for all the people of our country. The policies and programs are to give equal opportunity. The policies and programs are to help to improve the livelihood and living conditions of every single Guyanese. The policies and programs are to open up opportunities for every single Guyanese. I cannot develop a policy and program for every bandit that kills someone, for every farmer that does something illegal, or for every 
uh, every crime that happened out there. But what we have to do is to create the institutions and the mechanism to address it and ensure that people are brought to justice and people don't believe that they can get away scot-free with this. That is why when I said I offered uh, to support the police with all the resources that is required, all the resources in terms of the investigation and getting the investigation completed in a swift manner. Th that, is the, that, that is a matter for the police. The president can't determine who is to be charged. The president can't call the police and say it's a charge X and Y. That is a matter for the police. And you have to be fair in asking the question. You have to be fair in also the example we use. So I'm very, like you, I'm very concerned. Like you, I, I, I hope and I, I hope the police act swiftly. I know they're, they're working on the ground, but we have, an, we have to give them an opportunity to conclude and complete their work. We can't also have a situation where uh, in demonstrating our emotions, we do so in an unlawful manner and in an irresponsible manner. The two don't go hand in hand. The two don't go hand in hand. And I've seen some of the comments, exactly what you were saying. Some of the comments calling on the president to, to make the same strong statements and, and, and so on when, when people are killed. But the president would all is, I am hurt when any, any guy needs is affected. Especially in this, this horrific manner. There is no other word to describe it. Who those persons who are responsible for this are barbaric criminals. I can't see them being humans. So I think that address the issue in terms of COVID-19. Let us look at what is happening with COVID-19. Because again, there is a narrative that is being created. I remember from two days before I was sworn in, the numbers climbed. We are testing almost 500% more than what we were testing before. We have hundreds of people are turning up to be tested now that never took the opportunity to be tested. We were testing between 40 to 60 per day. We are testing some days 250 now. So if you are doing more tests, if you are more aggressive in reaching out to the people in doing the testing, then you expect that there will be a correlation. You expect that there will be a correlation. And in addressing that correlation, we have to address many issues. We have to address care. We have to address facilities and infrastructure. And we have to address the, the critical need, the ICU. Between the short time we're in government, we have 25, 29 new ventilators already in country. 16 more is coming, 40,000 new test kits. All that the last government did was to spend billions of dollars on the ocean, on the Lillian Dahl facility that cannot be used. There is no oxygen in there. There is no water in there. There is no electricity in there. There is no sewer system in there. We have fixed all of that in this month. We have fixed all of that in this month. In addition, and additionally, we are addressing the economic and social consequences of COVID-19. As president, I've spoken to uh, the government of Russia. I've spoken to the president of Brazil. I've, today at 6, I'm speaking to the president of Argentina. I've spoken to leaders in Latin America. I've spoken at CARICOM heads of government meeting. And all of it were conversations related directly to COVID-19. What can be done? What resources are, are available? We have reprogrammed 60 million US dollars for COVID directly. My discussion has been advanced to the stage now that I'm trying to put Guyana on the top priority for the vaccine when it comes. So that we, we don't have to wait until next August. 
is aggressively addressing the issue. These are the things that, these are the things that we're working on. We have just invested in a new COVID-19 a PCR machine that will do 900 tests per day. We have trained 30 new technicians to work in the lab. So when you ask what we are doing, this is what we are doing. This is what we are doing. The COVID-19 pandemic is, 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 not, uh, is not an easy public health issue because of the multifaceted nature of this pandemic. It has health implication, it has social implication, it has economic implication. But sometimes people try to complicate it by adding a political implication. I remember during the five months, I led efforts to go to every single community across this country to ensure people were wearing masks. When the government then did not support the mask campaign, it is the initiative that we started about Mask Up Guyana that saw more than 400,000 masks all across this country. So our commitment to the pandemic is second to none, and I dare say in the region. What we have done in the last month, what we have done in the last month has been tremendous in, in terms of this pandemic. Are you going to get more positive cases? Of course. You have a backlog of a thousand. You have an average of 300 persons turning up to be tested now, when it used to be 40 and 50. For the first time, we are taking testing to the interland regions. But what do we do? We can't just sit back and say, oh, there's an increase, the problem is getting larger. An increase doesn't mean the problem is getting larger. An increase means that the system is now working and the system is now turning out the, the results of, what, of the input that we're putting in place. So we have to deal with the output. That is why we had to make those quick investment in the Linian Dial facility to move that to the tra as a transition uh, area. Because in the transition at Georgetown Hospital, you were having cross-contamination. We reduced the bu bureaucracy. We put a specific medical group to look at the medical aspect. I am not a medical doctor, but I'm advised every day from that medical group as to what has to take place, as to what the needs are, as to where they need the support. And as a government, we have been giving that support. Mr. Adams. Mr. Adams, first of all, let me be very clear on this issue. Mr. Adams had 120 plus days leave. He has been sent on his leave. There is no issue with that. The Environmental Protection Agency is now headed by an interim person uh, that has more than 20 years service in the Environmental Protection Agency, fully qualified in the area of environment. Mr. Adams is not qualified in the area of environment, but I don't want to get into that. This is a person who is fully qualified in the area of environment. Does Mr. Adams has a uh, skill set that is needed for our country? Yes. Will Mr. Adams' skill set be re, uh, used in the development of our country? I have asked the Vice President to speak to him directly and to say to him, yes, your skill set will be used in the area that, 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 that it is. Is Mr. Adams a politician? Yes. Did Mr. Adams, uh, uh, was Mr. Adams a part of the platform of the AP and UFC? Yes. So we have to be careful when we say that someone is uh, only a professional. I have great respect for Mr. Adams and his, and his skill set. And that skill set will be used for our country. We have a situation now where our laws provide, where our laws provide that the environmental license and permit must only be for five years. That is the law of this country. The environmental permit for Exxon was signed for more than 20 years. Who signed it? 
Who signed it? As president, I have a responsibility. And I have a responsibility to be fair. And I've, that is how I live my life, in fairness. So, when we raise an issue, we must surround ourselves with the facts of that issue. So I thank you for the question and the opportunity to clear this up. And I say to you that in all three of the issues that you would have raised, I've addressed it from fair perspective, given the facts of the situation. Thank you very much. Yes. Darren Chabral, Jamar Waves News Talk Radio. Sir, could you say, um, and perhaps the Vice President too can, can shed some light on where the money will be coming from in the immediate future to fund all of these uh, measures that you've outlined today? And is your administration still going for an increase in the profit oil from the ExxonMobil agreement and the production share agreement that is looking for an increase in, in profit oil? Yeah, um, most of the measures, um, it, when you see the budget um, tomorrow, you will see that. Um, Repricing of expenditure. Yes, it is, it has to be financed, so we'd have to borrow because we have to continue borrowing, um, given that the revenue shortfall, and given what I said to you that. A lot of the expenditure is a rollover expenditure. So when we look at the foreign financing, they, we'd have to continue accessing the domestic market for financing the, the, the budget. Um, we're hoping that in maybe a year or two to not just correct this, but also to retire all of the domestic debt or a significant part of the domestic debt that APNU um, took to finance previous budgets, which are reflected in Treasury bills issued for, for um, fiscal purposes and this huge overdraft at the central bank. So immediately, we'll have to continue borrowing um, from the domestic market. We are doing so carefully so it doesn't crowd out um, private sector investment or would not push up interest rates, but in the short to medium term, we want not only to, to reverse this, but also to retire some of our borrowing from the domestic market that already took place. Um, the issue with Payara had nothing to do with the profit oil now. Oh, okay. Um, we, we know the agreement, the contract, we made it clear through the campaign that at this point in time, we are not renegotiating the Stabrook agreement that we, but Exxon, for since they're the major operator, they're the operator and one of the major shareholders in both the Kanji and Kaichur blocks, that when they come up for a licensing on those blocks, that they will not get the same conditions as they got on, in the Stabrook agreement that was signed on the APNU. They, um, they would, that is why we promise that as soon as we get past this immediate hurdle of the local and the gas project and maybe addressing quickly the natural resources fund we we'll continue to work on uh, in fact we'll work on a standard production sharing agreement and a, st or a standard agreement which will all all future operators will have to subject themselves to
the, we can say that um, right now they're on the draft licenses they are narrowing the gap and there is a, a gap between it started off with like I'm told 40 issues and they've narrowed it down to maybe about seven or eight now which agreement on most and so I expect these are the most contentious ones and so the two we we've given direction to continue that process um, so I can't say exactly when that would be completed at some point in time it shall come to the policy makers and we will then examine whether some issues are of a technical nature there are things that you can never compromise on which is the safety issues and stuff like that the safety of our people etc um, there are some policy issues that have been inserted here for example um, a carbon either paying for the pollution that the local the, um, the, the, the carbon related pollution that the local operations will, will emit and they, that's a, more of a policy issue because it's linked in to the global issue of how we treat um, carbon emissions that's a separate matter but on issues like where it it deals with effluents and stuff like that those are rigidly under the control of the EPA and we have to ensure that things are done safely all right thank thank you you someone have a question uh, right, Jar take the last question yeah okay Jaraba in the evening news um what will be the mechanism used for distributing the, um, the cash grant to each household, taking into account uh, COVID-19 and social distancing? And there, were o there was over $9 billion in funds from um, Norway through the Red Plus Fund that was on hold until after the conclusion of the elections. What's the status of that? Um, we have, we have re-engaged um, Norway so as soon as the budget is done we're gonna start the discussions not only for that the release of the funds that were put on hold um, because of democracy issues but we we are looking for a new program with Norway so we've already made the initial contact and we will um, continue working as soon as this the budget is completed and passed Secondly, you want me to explain yeah, that? The, we've, we've had numerous challenges how to get the money to people as swiftly as possible because they've had a system where people can, should register online, but many people in the rural areas, the hinterland, even in, in Georgetown and places, can't, can't go and register online. They don't have access to Wi-Fi, etc. Then we were concerned that if we give the money to the NDCs alone, then maybe you'd have a lack of accountability. And one of the reasons why we decided more to move away from targeted approach, because we know if it's $25,000 per household, some wealthier families will get the money too. We're hoping they don't take it. But if you had only sent out teams to go and say, you, you decide which household, they could, it could be done in an arbitrary fashion and often with discrimination. And you know all sorts of issues come, come into play. So the easiest way is to say each household must be a, a beneficiary. Now each house. So what an extensive form has been developed that has the name of the recipients, the ID card etc particulars we are going to go out the teams are going out with a voucher they would properly be have to attired with PPEs and stuff go to the home with a voucher hopefully the, with a card of vouchers they'll be given like vouchers with sequential numbers the vouchers 
hopefully will be by regions so it's hard to duplicate and they'll have to account for each voucher and then on each form they would have go to every home and say you're eligible for one voucher so so the person they would put the number of the voucher and the form id they would countersign the 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 form and the voucher two or three persons there with a household hopefully that will be the most accountable way and then they have to come back in and account for it now there may be in some households more than one how in, in some houses more than one households but they would have to now fill up those forms and come and make a case for those because if we allow the people going out to give out 10 in a household then everybody may want to to take you know you can have corruption too but if it's one per household at least initially and you get the bulk of the the money into people's hands or the vouchers into their hands then we can always come back and deal with the the houses where you have multiple households so that is what we're hoping to put in place that you can get it out in a transparent way and the auditor general part of it. Yes, and all of this has to be audited. All of it has to be. There will be a unit that would have to present to the auditor general. Mr. My reaction is very simple. I condemn every single act in this country that had criminality in it. I remember when we spoke about uh, when we spoke about the, the, those issues during uh, ju just after the elections. Not only did we condemn, I had more than five statements where I call upon people to act responsibly. While we call on people to be peaceful, we call on people to be respectful. And you will know, Dennis, that when the temperature was so, was so high during that period, we called, we went out there and talked to the people to come off the road. We talked to the people to go back home. You recall this at Luziknan in, in Bath. That is what we went to do. That is the approach we took, and that is our approach. So Mr. Granger has a, a responsibility, and uh, in going there, you can, either, you can either help the situation by talking to people to be lawful and respectful, or you can decide to ignite the situation. For us, we, our, our focus is on reducing flames, improving relations, and having a more peaceful society. But Mr. Granger um, should not be taken seriously. He ran this country for five years. And in the period that he ran the country, our international standing regressed, our democracy suffered, people lost jobs by the droves, he dismantled a social safety net that we were starting to put in place for individuals. And his rhetoric has always been partisan. Damaging. Damaging. And he should not be taken seriously. This is, this is some, a politician who has failed in fi five years to do anything to improve relations. And he, Mr. Granger obviously doesn't read much because if he were to go now to look at the party's Facebook page, you would see a condemnation of the bus incident on the party's page. I personally approved that and put it on the party's page when it took place. And so he 
obviously is caught up with the dossier because the, the dossier that he had, the Washington based one that they paid for, that's what they put in. Half of it was about that incident, as though it was PPP inspired. We condemned it. So he is, should not be taken seriously. Uh, Samuel Sugnandan, NCN News. Can I just ask one question quickly? I, I just said that was a uh, Go ahead, go ahead, quickly. Okay, um, in relation to the 5 billion to Gaisuku, how will that be? In uh, relation to? The 5 billion to Gaisuku, how will that be uh, dispersed? And could you say if there's a specific timeline for the reopening of sugar estates? Is it going to well, be a phased approach? Well, well it's ver very quickly. Um, as I speak to you now, the assessment is continuing on all the estates. So we'll have to have capital investment to return uh, some of these estates uh, into, uh, into a situation where they can actually uh, be utilized, the factories. We have to have field preparation. So the $5 billion is going to go into the agricultural aspect for field preparation and so on. Then also for investment in capital to bring back the factories uh, operationally. And then, of course, some of it will go to direct help for uh, families who would have suffered, as you would have said in the manifesto. In Wales, for example, the factory is completely gone. It has been cannibalized. So we have to help those families, whilst at the same time, we are now working on, um, we are now working on a Wales Development Authority that would have a, a special incentive regime, not only for Wales, but for other communities to, to create a factor for investment and the creation of jobs. So it is budget support for the industry. All right. Thank you very much.